very much, Chris, and thank you all the colleagues at British Computer Society West Yorkshire. I hope I will make our uh, voice heard across the uh, country, and not just. I'm so pleased actually to come back at uh, Chris's invitation. Um, and to talk to you this time, I was sitting in the British Com Society West Yorkshire uh, Committee uh, some years ago now. Um, and I'm pleased actually to discuss about um, responsible artificial intelligence for a number of reasons. Um, and one of the most important ones is that I am myself a voice of uh, the work we're doing in Bradford um, in the artificial intelligence research group. Um, and I'm benefiting into this presentation uh, from the work of some colleagues that I mentioned here, Dr. Paul Trundle, Dr. Amri Abdulatif, uh, John Marco, a PhD student of ours working exactly on responsible AI, um, and a few other actually uh, students and colleagues who I haven't mentioned here uh, because of the space, but I'm very happy to refer to their work um, and their advancements. I'm so pleased actually to present this because it was uh, in my to-do list for a while. Um, and I'll share it with some other colleagues. We have a reading club uh, that is open uh, floor actually for colleagues, um, particularly working with some colleagues in, uh, from Spain and Canada, as well as actually from Bradford. So let's talk about responsible artificial intelligence, which is such a challenging topic nowadays for many reasons. Um, because actually is uh, opening um, uh, so many questions uh, that are at the same time philosophical, scientific, not that philosophy and sciences will, wouldn't be actually into the same, uh, on the same table, but because at the same time we'll see that even from a religious perspective you know, and the legal perspective and definitely professional perspective, we are swimming through very challenging waters at the moment. And we have to be part of the game in the most active and interactive way. So in this uh, talk, I'll try to discuss um, and to make practically the presence of um, responsible artificial intelligence as um, just one step within a, such a large um, ocean of topics that are nowadays fashionable. And I'm talking about big data, I'm talking about uh, computer science, I'm talking about uh, generally intelligence, I'm talking about machine learning, algorithms, um, high performance computing, and so many other things, including cybersecurity, privacy, and so on, that nowadays actually are part of. Um, our lives and will be even more. Um, so the outline today will look into the context that is why we're talking responsible AI nowadays is because on one side, the journey on artificial intelligence started, believe it or not, again, thanks to a number of um, um, scientific minds like uh, Alan Turing and like Ada Lovelace like many other actually people who were uh, born in England and not just, uh, but at the same time, because we like to look into what are the current challenges that our own work uh, are um, uh, coming with, uh, challenges that will be part of our near future and our jobs. So we'll talk about expectations, challenges and dilemmas as well because of responsible AI. So let me challenge you, everybody, and let's try to set up the grounds. So these are keywords, they are concepts, and as um, an academic, and as a, a person uh, with um, a both backgrounds in a computer science from a software development perspective, as well as from a automation robotics perspective, um, and with the head of the uh, PhD in artificial intelligence, I need to tell you what data, information, and knowledge concepts are to help us to define intelligence and to say why we're talking about models uh, through machine um, uh, intelligence and machine learning. So data, and I'm benefiting here, uh, from the words that were published, not anymore, to some extent, uh, in the Foldoc uh, dictionary. 
set up probably 20 years ago uh, in Imperial College in London. I need to discuss what data is and what information would be for us. So technically, we'll start with the information because we are talking and we'll talk about uh, intelligence from a human perspective. We're talking about human intelligence here and automatically we define what machine intelligence is, the artificial intelligence. So information for us would be those things, and we mean people, objects, events that are coming in a form or another suitable for human sensing and interpretation to provide us meanings. Now, technically, is the way we capture our communication with the environment through our senses. And automatically data will be the information that we are able to sense, that information being digitally stored, transmitted, transmitted or processed at least, so practically making use of the machines. And we know that that is the digital format of it because we're currently still able to do just binary representation. Hopefully soon we'll see what the quantum computing will say. At the moment we are still within mainly traditional binary representation of the information. Grand. So if information is that uh, collection of uh, signals sent to the human being that we are able to interpret due to our senses, then what is knowledge? Well, knowledge is that theoretical and practical comprehension of certain domains that will support us making decisions. Right, so knowledge will allow us to start thinking. So we can actually be flushed with information we can communicate with the machines through the digital format of the information, but our problem is hopefully to make use of knowledge in a, and I'm jumping a little bit the slides, in a supervised or unsupervised way to take decisions, to be able to make decisions. So what is intelligence then is our capability to learn, and we'll come back to this, refer to this definition to learn, to understand, and to find solutions for problems in a specific domain. And this is where we have expertise and we look to religious, scientific, professional, legal, ethical, and so many other facets of the society, of the human society. Of course, we create models. We have our own models based on our information. We keep in mind practically patterns, in order to react fast, because that's how our memory works. And automatically, we should be able to recall them once you have the memory. So we can see already that intelligence requires both knowledge based on the information and its storage. The memory, without memory, probably will have big problems with making knowledge work. Grant, so what is intelligence then? Hopefully, actually, we can see ourselves in there. So intelligence is that, and I am thankful to say the information collected through Bing, Bard, GPT here. So I'm already jumping again, again ahead. Intelligence is the complex and multifaceted ability to acquire, right, to use senses to get the information, the knowledge uh, building to us, well, sometimes data as well, to understand, to process, to apply and retain knowledge. So if I can put it this way, if I can name information into my metaphor of ingredients for cooking, okay, then intelligence is the way to make those ingredients working to create the dish that will keep us surviving and enjoying life. So intelligence encompasses a wide range of mental abilities. By mental, we'll see what happens next. And skills. So practically is the way to process, the way to decide, and the way to apply the decisions, allowing the individuals to adapt to the environment, solve problems, so be creative, learn from experience, and that means learning from mistakes as well, reason, and engage in abstract thinking, allowing actually creation, creativity to move to the next generation. Grant, we know already what's going on and what motivates um, the uh, move into an efficient um, 
artificial intelligence, and therefore I'll jump over this slide, just reminding you that Alan Turing in 1950s predicted, so he used his own knowledge and intelligence to tell us that about 2000 will have computers with a storage capacity of memory of about 128 megabytes. We can count down what was going on at the time. So to see if his predictive abilities work, worked. At the same time, we know that the Moose laws and the Crider's laws uh, were uh, fitting well into our environment that was growing and was growing to the level of um, practically allowing what our creativity to work for us in order to free our minds after it freed our hands. So what happens actually in the current times, and again, I'll refer to them through, from a historical perspective, is that we have nowadays a number of big data catalysts that allows us to actually allowed us continuously to move on in terms of creativity and their applications. So nowadays we are practically playing the game of Internet of Things, moving Internet of Everything, living in smart cities of whatever type, benefiting of the advantages and disadvantages of online social networks, creating and using data from public and private resources, online social networks, Wikipedia, projects, for example, the human genome, the weather forecasting things, the government data, scientific data as well, um, cultural data and information, uh, publicly available scientific information, public in, uh, publicly made available in PubMed, archive, and so on private data resources that we know that hopefully we can defend as well. And many others have here actually the entire wave of how the information is created on the top floor of our IBM model for Internet of Things, down to our mobile phones and equipment in house, and the entire communication ways that move upwards and uh, forwards and backwards between ourselves and the society. And I'll make use of what is going on at the top level because I'll come back to the industrial revolution that is creating this environment for us, this context of asking ourselves where the artificial intelligence is. So big data in its own challenging features that will make and made the computers our computational tools not able to cope, but actually to require more and more power. And this is how we moved from individual equipment, to network equipment, to cloud equipment, to practically making the earth just an internet village. Okay, we know that there are many challenges created because of this big data. While the first ones were, of course, because it's big data was volume, and then the velocity of the creation of the data, we know that data comes in its hypermedia format. So the variety of the data makes this challenging actually in complexity of calculations even more important for us. So the variety of data will affect the quality of the data, its access, its representation, its processing um, outcomes as well. But data comes with value, and this is why we're here nowadays. And data comes with many other features that, funnily, funnily enough, will have a pattern, the big data Vs features, that will create challenges for the computational format of the knowledge. All these practically uh, features that grown with time are now in terms of 42, we can actually see them, Okay, and even growing, showing us that vagueness, the venue, okay, who's using it, as well as the resources, the providers, the volatility of the data, data started disappearing, the speed and the uh, resources will make the volatility of the data a reality. We do not find anymore some data that we were uh, um, aware of at a particular time. The virality of the data that will create uh, these waves of news, fake news, and so on, and its viability. The veracity of the data, 
and its uh, vocabulary sides will create challenges for a new trend and a new power of the computers that is artificial intelligence that we need to process the volume and the quality of the information at our hands. So in my scholar kind of a vision of this talk, I started asking myself, can I put together the say hardware and the software trajectory journey in our society simply because as programmers we have seen exactly this challenge of high level programming and low level programming isn't it so we talk about low level programming as being close to the machine we can put bits in the memory that will have a direct touch of the equipment and even interaction with the environment. But we can program nowadays at very high level by giving stories to say generative AI tools that will transfer, will translate our thoughts in problem solving, in solutions, in code, in data, and so on, which means that we have at one level, at the highest level, say artificial intelligence expectations for problem solving, at the bottom level, the equipment in a similar way that industries were revolutionizing our society. And I'll refer to the history of the artificial intelligence that started, say, with actually, if you want my opinion, it started about 2000 and more years ago when the computational tool in Antikythera was trying to calculate the planet's journey seems to be guessed many many years before practically we were thinking that we can do mechanics and then electronics to help us computing but we can see in this journey that artificial intelligence as a form of computation benefited unfortunately of a number of additions that happened from logic invented in england by the way okay and i can mention bull charles babbage and i ada lovelace then practically the neural networks models invented in around the second world war times uh, and very related in their own model with neural um with transistors as transverse functions. Then benefiting again linked to the Second World War by Alan Turing's um, um, paper actually, and way of thinking that the machine will start showing intelligence. And we are at the times just now when it seems that the machines for the first time will pass the Turing uh, test. And we're moving into closer and closer solutions that show some kind of reactions to the humans and other machines that if shown by a machine uh, by a human being will be called intelligent so very interestingly we can look into the five industrial revolutions and i wanted to bring this parallel between high level programming and say the equipment the low level programming because nowadays we are just stepping into what is called Industry 5.0. So very quickly, just to recapitulate, at some time in the past of the humanity, somebody or somebody's, a few buddies invented the wheel that actually helped the human to transport more and make use of some safe time for thinking. And Industry 1.0 happened by all means in Bradford as well, when, and you can go to see the Leeds Liverpool Canal, when we were able to use, so our um, uh, people at the time were using actually the mechanization, the steam and water power to create the first computing machines because the weaving machines were computers. We can go and see them into the industrial museum. You can see actually the plaque at, uh, in, um, uh, on Leeds Liverpool Canal, when it says that the Leeds Liverpool Canal has been done in 1780s, 1750s to 1800s. So we are 
witnessing practically industrial industry one revolution in our place and we moved to industry two zero that was related to creating the replacement of the steam power with electrical power industry three zero revolution that was the first moment when the computers and particularly robotics were invented to paint car doors to practically create even more time for us to start thinking engineering and nowadays we are in the industry 4.0 revolution when we enjoy what even more actually smart factories and we're moving into industry 5.0 that is defined as a human centric revolution with its abilities to create sustainable industries and resilient industries which are expected from us as well to do it good so if industries revolutions can be aligned with the artificial intelligence stepping stones because AI is involved from industry 3.0 onwards into our society, what are the keywords related to the way the artificial intelligence works? So just putting very uh, quickly the things together, artificial intelligence is using as a subsection its machine learning approaches through algorithms that would make use of data, particularly or interaction between the human expert and the data with a very specialized subsection of it deep learning that is simulating even more the brain organization and its connections with the hope to create intelligent reactions but in terms of the artificial intelligence we have practically algorithms that play the game of supervised versus unsupervised learning in which we have labeled outputs or not and nowadays we can see through deep learning actually the reinforcement learning coming to create what uh, hopefully will be the uh, artificial general intelligence so if you look into the picture in the center actually is a nightmare of artificial intelligence tools that already appeared and will continue to appear it seems that i'm not able to run all the uh, videos that i wanted to i'm happy to share the links with you but artificial intelligence intelligence nowadays is making its impact in almost everywhere from face recognition image recognition video processing to robotic motion through practically the best example is Boston Dynamics, through medical and healthcare progresses and drug discoveries with their challenges. And I'll just refer to the artificial intelligence used in drug discovery, just thinking about the machine models that will create simply an outcome, yes, no, for toxicity of chemical compounds that will be the new drugs. Just imagine if the machine is wrong when uh, saying that a particular drug that has been just invented, for example, an antibiotic that we learned in the news that it already happened, uh, will create a drug that the machine, uh, the machine learning model will say that is not toxic, but it is. That will create practically diseases, illnesses, if not killing people, which is not something that will be welcome uh, or from a responsible perspective. On the other side, if the drug is non-toxical but is created, to, uh, is guessed as being toxical, then what it happens is the company inventing it may lose millions and millions in their investments. So I'll just very quickly jump into the fact that uh, generative AI. The artificial intelligence that is using deep learning comes with impact in our lives, positive or negative. We started seeing fake news, fake videos, fake practically faces, including about myself. So let me show you what is going about myself. I went to GPT, yeah, it is indeed GPT 3.5, and I asked what book has been written by myself. And GPT mentioned something interesting. At a book created, a book published in 2019. Yes, I have a book published in 2019. Actually, was written by me, among others. Great, uh, that's uh, correct. And the book is called Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence Approach. Uh, wrong. <laughs> so it seems that another book of another author has been put on my name because I claimed that I was doing machine learning, which is correct. So what I'm saying here is the fact that um, transformers are playing the game of being creative to a level where some people will call it a lie which is bad news and you can see it actually that this will have an impact and probably will fight even more in uh, our times um, look at 
deepfakes. I'm sorry you cannot hear it, but actually you can read it and you can search for the moon disaster. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> That's bad news, isn't it? So almost everybody can have their words, their faces, and so on um, cracked in there. So I've done it with Dali. I've taken actually the picture of Bradford City Center, the um, Bradford City Council uh, Square, the Millennium Square, uh, and I put it in Dali. And I asked Dali to do it for me. I asked Bradford City Center to be created in four paintings in four styles, Impressionist, Renaissanceist, Van Gogh style, and Da Vinci. So you can see the Van Gogh style. We have flowers, we have the greens, the blues, the yellows. So it seems that actually is quite nicely done. It is, but, but we start seeing the effect into the artist's lives because the artists nowadays fight AI programs because they cannot make their own livings and that's bad news isn't it and this bad news for many but others can make it a living with it because they are making use of ai to create their own artistic work that is even rewarded so making use of dali actually for their own benefit interesting nowadays interesting times so very quickly for yourselves uh, I'd like you to write down, because we don't have time, unfortunately, to write down the BBC News uh, quiz and to tell me at the end, because there are eight questions, to tell me which one you'll go for in question four. What will make you deciding what will be the, uh, I'll practically play with it, okay, in order to simply to get to the uh, question four. Of course, I am wrong. Of course, I'll be wrong again. Well, I, let's let's try to be correct this time. Okay, but here, just look at the pictures. One of them is a deep fake. Please try to decide which one is fake, and just keep in mind what made you thinking that is a fake. Grand. So. I'll just go very quickly, practically, to tell you that the uh, community. Nowadays, the AI community is making itself <laughs> the presence thing that there is a risk with the artificial intelligence. And this list is ongoing. I'm sure actually you heard about Geoffrey Hinton from Google actually coming now to say that he doesn't like the fact that he was the one of the inventors of deep learning. And many other people actually, including Bill Gates and so on, at one side. But we have at the other end, Andrew Nge saying the opposite. No thumb, Prof. I know. I can read it for you. Yes, I work in AI. I feel an ethical responsibility to keep an open mind and understand the risk. And I would like your help. Thank you, Andrew. Actually, uh, he already moved on. He had an interview, uh, actually uh, a discussion 
uh, with Geoffrey Hinton on uh, exactly this question. And uh, there are many practically ways to think about what is going on with AI, if is a challenge and a danger to the human society or not. So um, there are practically avenues, continuous discussions about experts talking about safe systems. And if the jobs are at risk, how actually the models will be aligned with the uh, laws, including the UK, EU, China, the United States laws about AI. We know that there are jobs like AI officers will appear soon, if not already. There are challenges in terms of the solutions between the different companies being well known now of doing um, uh, artificial intelligence research uh, from XI that is uh, practically moving uh, into a more philosophical approach of artificial intelligence and open AI that is very practical and requesting um, uh, acknowledgement of innovation as they are. And what I'm telling you is just the role of the artificial intelligence that is helping us, remember, creating intelligence from knowledge to look backwards to diagnostics and descriptive analytics and to look forward to do predictive analytics and pre prescriptive analytics. So practically to have an impact in our own uh, life. Let's move now into the responsibility part. So apologies for this. It should have taken even longer, actually. Um, so let's talk about the responsibility. I am picking up the keywords that I've taken from GPT and a few other sources related to responsibility. So responsibility for humans is that duty or obligation of the individual or the group in the society to demonstrate ethical and moral behavior through accountability, reliability, ethical decision making, ability to learn from mistakes, interesting for our talk, and having a significant role to build trust and respect. So the question is, are we doing this? Because practically in Responsible AI, we're dealing with big data. The ingredients for cooking artificial intelligence, for creating intelligence, is data. The data is publicly or privately available, remember, with many Vs, many challenges, including volatility, vagueness, um, um, its volume, and its value. And many problems are should be created by the fact that the data is imbalanced. And we know already statistical approaches for how the data should be managed when it's under sampling or over sampling. But each time we're doing what? Starting creating synthetic lies because actually adversarial learning or uh, as multi kind of approaches will do what? Will create data or will cut off data. Uh, so practically we move from the reality into a computational environment, ecosystem. So there are risks when our models that hopefully will show reactions that if shown from people will be called as intelligent will relate to some data that comes with so many defects and so many challenges themselves okay and how we can do this remember when still is fashionable just look onto the bottom item here practically when many people are still claiming to do data driven data Centric. Oh God, we depend on our food. Data enabled. So we cannot do by just being enabled by data. Data enhanced AI models. We need to take responsibility back. We need to put data back into our own kind of a trust and confidence standards and automatically to move from governing through numbers into back decision support with some human in the loop. So what are the risks? The risks are practically that human expert knowledge is kind of a moving to machine learning models. And we know when he invented the wheel, <laughs> we started um, making muscles in the gym because we didn't do the muscles in the working field. So it seems to be a challenge to our thinking and intelligence when, when the artificial, artificial intelligence is always almost invited to be strong AI, so try to be general, as general as possible, when we invented the models to be weak AI, so try to be focused, to be narrow, to be practically personalized to the data at hand. So we have actually problems that the general artificial intelligence is claimed to be, 
but for us is creating responsibility issues that were seen even since 1950s by Isaac like Asimov with its robot laws that I'll invite you actually to read them because they are claiming responsibility features like accountability, reliability, ethics, and learning from mistakes. So I need your input, please. Also, it will take some time. Please type in in your browser menti.com and use the following code 32953022. You have the same words listed on your screen and pick up five that you consider that will define responsible AI. So are strongly related to responsibility of the artificial intelligence. Remember, I was trying in my talk to talk about intelligence to not make a big difference, to be ethically, <laughs> practically accepting the robots in our society and ecosystem. And of course, everybody else, all humans alike. And I was asking myself, let's try to apply the same norm to the artificial intelligence. If we want to the artificial intelligence to be responsible, we need to apply our own laws. So see which ones from accountability, awareness, balance, conscience, consideration, explainability, effectiveness, efficiency, empathy, <laughs> ethics, fairness, reliability, responsibility, robustness, safety, sustainability, transparency, trustworthiness, vision, and bias could be there. Unfortunately, I've put a short list of 20 simply to take your time for that. They are listed into there and we can have a quick look if voting is ongoing. Already three votes. Beautiful. Well done. Keep voting. We need to learn from ourselves. We do crowd intelligence, which is limited statistical design. It's coming. Well done. Keep going. Keep going. I'll come back because I have so much still to tell you. So responsible AI, from my very limited perspective at the time, involves, keep voting, <laughs> explainable AI, what is called XI, trustworthy AI, ethical AI, and then my guess is, that were invented with Paul Trundle many years ago, efficient AI and effective AI. Efficient is mostly related to high performance computing, to sustainable, low consumption of energy and so on. The effective AI, you will see it, is mostly related to things that will make the life better. So let's read very quickly some of these responsible AI issues that are still to be researched. Is an open-ended territory where doing research, come back to us, you have our names and we're happy to learn from you and to invite you in our reading club that runs on Thursdays on responsible AI in healthcare. Thursdays at 3 p.m. unfortunately because our Canadian colleagues actually are uh, available at 9 a.m. their time. So in terms of the responsible AI in general terms, we have already an organization in the UK with an Edinburgh Declaration on Responsibility for Responsible AI that is setting up the scales. But what is an interesting story is that while responsible AI is of a low profile, its components that we just mentioned and you are still voting are more visible. And the most established one is the explainable AI. What is explainable AI? Well, we just mentioned that actually we're trying to uh, use computational power to mimic the human brain with the hope that will create intelligence as it is. So, but neural networks and particularly deep learning in neural networks is so hidden, so compact is not transparent at all. How can we make it transparent? Mm, maybe by the invention of the layers, a lot of research work to do in that area. And we have a toolkit from IBM, an IBM AI explainability toolkit that is kind of on the border between uh, technical artificial intelligence explainable with some uh, techniques to extract rules from there and some social sciences in terms of explainable AI. And of course, we have more in explainable AI in industry that I can invite you to read uh, that has been published in 2020 uh, by ACM.org, the Association for Computing Machinery, our sister organization in the, in the United States. What is trustworthy AI? Well, in terms of the keywords, idle uh, linked and still uh, ongoing work, trustworthy with, and prove me that I'm wrong, still an open research area. 
reliability, privacy preserving, and human-centric, remember Industry 5.0, keywords, human-centric approach, because trustworthy is linked actually to our ability to trust the um, AI solutions. So yes, we have some interesting avenues in there as well. And I strongly encourage you to look at human AI, the human-centered AI work funded by the European uh, Commission and available already um, on the internet. Very interesting uh, days as well. The most work that has been done to date, and I remember actually the uh, times of 2018, 19, um, are mostly related to ethical AI. So ethical AI actually includes words like fairness, very important actually, uh, keyword that is related to our imbalanced, unbiased, data that actually is not because most of the data we have it remember the drug design but actually many things happening in the area of medical and healthcare inputs are the fact that people were not represented but because actually for example healthy people are more present than unhealthy ones our data is imbalanced and that will trigger bias into our, into our models and the same will happen with many others' decisions that are accountable and we know the stories. I'll jump quickly into the last slide to make you happy. I know I'm a little bit late. So about efficiency and effectiveness. So efficient AI would be related to a sustainable solution into which high performance computing, maybe quantum computing as well, will save our lives because nowadays artificial intelligence at the level of GPT scale and not just is eating energy created by full dumps um, um, and that's not sustainable in the in the future so we need probably to move into more safe more sustainable solutions at the same time the effectiveness is linked to reliability clearness accuracy relevant ai and again balanced as i mentioned so let's move back to our votes and listen here from your questions please I just opened the territory and I knew I won't have time to do it. So this is why I called to talk introduction to responsive base too much to say right now. Wow, we have already so many votes. Accountability is a point. I haven't touched the legal side of the story is a lot going on into that uh, part as well. But trustworthiness is what makes me happy to see it in there. And I'm so happy to see transparency, the technical part, hand in hand with explainability and robustness. Very good point because the robustness is moving back into our territory of computer scientists. And reliability is a story moving into the social sciences as well. And we have the unbiased part and the balance. Very good, many thanks for your votes. I'll keep voting tomorrow with my colleagues from the Reading Club and I'll report back to you to have this slide actually shared. Let's hear from your questions, please. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you very much for that, Dan. We do have a few questions, and I'm sure some more will keep coming in. So, I know Shall I stop sharing these... the screen? Um, you can do if you like. It's not sure. Uh, I'll I'll keep going. So I'll just listen to your questions. I cannot see the what is written. So yeah. Um. So I know a couple of these did actually get answered. Um, one of the ones which a few people have asked now is about the reading club. Uh -huh. um, can you please repeat what the Club for Responsible AI in Healthcare is again? Yes, uh, so we have um, a local initiative. It's a research initiative into the Artificial Intelligence Research Club at the University, Artificial Intelligence Research Group at the University of Bradford. Uh, I'm running it during the summertime with my colleagues from Queen's University in Canada and a few colleagues from uh, Spain and students, interns and research students from Bradford. Uh, we're happy to take on board um, uh, practically to come whenever you want it is an open-ended territory in which we present papers and work related to responsible AI. Tomorrow I'll present again these slides because it's a kind of a break for our teams in preparation of new papers that will be presented from next week. So it's research paper reading and comments. They are scheduled through an MS Teams practically call that I can share with you each Thursdays from 3 p.m. during the summertime. And you can continue it because hopefully you can make it a touring 
and the British Common Society event during the academic times as well, so practically from October. At the moment, definitely will be uh, three more meetings uh, from tomorrow and the first two weeks in August. So if people are interested in this, I can share with you, Chris, the MS Teams call. And we welcome um, uh, any volunteers to join in and to participate in the talks. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. So I'll go from the top of the questions. Like I said, I know a few of these may have been answered already. Um, mm -hmm. So how AI in itself can be called responsible or irresponsible, is it how we use it? Yes, a good point. And actually, this is the legal side of the story and the professional one. I have it somewhere in the links in the papers uh, mentioned already. So uh, at the moment, the um, uh, remember the painting story in which OpenAI has been already called um, in the court by artists because they are happy that their own. Um, so let me get there. Um, Okay, so their work has been uh, shared in, um, okay, here, so through OpenAI is this part, okay, look in this uh, paper, for example, so the artists were fighting practically open AI because their work has been, I'm sorry for the adverts and so on, have been copied and have been copied and uh, left for free, okay? And this is not something they enjoyed, but at the same time, others are making use of it. So what happens is um, the AI in itself, at the end of the day, is either a model that is owned and governed by a company, and we know nowadays that we have access to the APIs, for example, of GPT, and in some uh, with business or with... Uh, private uh, money or with uh, freeware kind of things. We have access to different uh, libraries in which we can create uh, our own software and interfaces making use of a particular model on the AI. Okay, we have actually, for example, Python libraries that are creating paintings from our photos, simply applying a painter style, in, including some painting styles that are available for free on the net, where the artists are sharing their own work and now is stolen as public or stolen, borrowed, learned from by the um, web scrappers and made use in the training of some uh, AI tools. So where is the uh, responsibility or irresponsibility actually of the AI tool? No, because the artificial intelligence yet has no personality and no identity in itself, but it belongs to a company, an individual, or is freely available. So to some extent, we are not going yet into the responsibility of the AI in itself, though I presume uh, very soon this will happen. There are trends actually to register, I think, marriages with uh, an artificial intelligence entity or uh, to make use of some presences. And we know that the humans are very interested in personalizing our abilities to personalize the inputs. And that actually has a, um, a mental, psychological, as well as medical effect as well. So at the moment, I don't have an answer for this question, but watch the space more will come from our legal teams. I am aware about a work that has been funded by the British government, as well as by the European Commission, in the area of the responsibility, legal responsibility of AI solutions, for example, for autonomous cars. Yes. So not yet an answer there. Uh, if I can please take this question further. In fact, I had asked a question. Uh, I'm Dr. Basit Chazad, uh, currently a visiting scientist at University of Cambridge, and I'm working on the large language models. Uh, in a recent uh, uh, discussion, I, I happened to see uh, uh, like we had a question like this that if the uh, accountability uh, can be fixed on GPT for producing some text or not. And the answer was no, because uh, for the very obvious reason, because the uh, GPT or LLM is being used by someone and uh, GPT and LLM themselves are not, uh, are not responsible for what has been generated. So if I generate a text from GPT and submit uh, uh, as a paper uh, in my name, so the responsibility of, of doing that thing 
lies in me, not on GBT. Likewise, uh, if, we, if, if, if we take this scenario, to this, this discussion, this shows that the, a, the AI in, in itself cannot be responsible or irresponsible unless there is, there is an element of accountability. And since it is always triggered by the humans, not by itself, therefore the accountability thing perhaps will not, uh, will not fix on AI as well. So since there cannot be any accountability, how it can be uh, like responsible or, 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 or irresponsible for that matter? Yes, so I was trying actually to find the link, uh, the most relevant link. So um, very short, accountability is has at least two sides, two facets. One is the legal facet, the other one is the moral facet, okay? Um, if I use, for example, my own sleep model or sleep-based model to watch myself um, about my practically daily journey into the, say, summer times, and I learned that I need to sleep or I can sleep four hours a day because I still resist and my heart beats. I can push myself on the edge and I am morally responsible and accountable to myself. In the moment I apply the same logic to, for example, my children or a relative or a friend, I become um, accountable, depends if the, depending actually if there is evidence on that, from a legal perspective and a moral perspective as well. And uh, I mentioned a model, okay? The model can be, can be even an equation, not necessarily um, an AI um, a model, but in the moment you are going into the LLM, the secret is the following. And I mention it because of my story about big data. I wanted to mention that the current generative AI models uh, accessed either through the um, human interface, chat, bots, audio, video, and so on, or through other equipment, okay, they are based on training. So there is a learning perspective in there in which information is picked up by that particular model. You can call it GPT, you can call it BARD, you can call it Bloom, you can call it Alexa, okay? And is, I showed it actually in my case with GPT, is learning. Originally, before that question on myself and my books, GPT said, doesn't know Daniel Nagu. I felt a little bit sad. <laughs> GPT doesn't know me and it knows so many others. And then keeping asking questions about myself, GPT practically adapted <laughs> to my existence and started actually making even up things about myself. So is that accountable? Because that book exists actually and is a very well-known title actually. So the accountability, I think it starts to be shared exactly like, and I'll make a parallel that has no legal um, uh, say roots, um, but is my example into the classroom, cooking. So let's imagine the model is a dish. I am a restaurant owner and, uh, and I am at the same time the cook, okay? I have somebody in my team or myself buying ingredients and I'm going to cook some dishes that I sell or I can give them for free to other people in the evening, okay? Let's talk about fish dishes. In the summer times at 40 degrees is not recommended to be bought and uh, sold because it may carry some bacteria because of the different processing issues. Okay, so my data could be perfect, but some of it may be imperfect, either missing or poisonous, toxic in a way or another. I'm still doing my dish. I'm cooking according to a recipe that has been acknowledged publicly or privately by a patent, by a research paper and so on. I'm paying for my environment, my restaurant, and I'm cooking the dishes. And then let's say I'll sell five and I'll give away two for free. One of the persons in there may be, may have, for example, an allergy, allergy to antibiotics one of my ingredients has been affected by some bacteria, say penicillin related, and that person lands in the hospital because of the dish they ate for me. I do not even know if they 
bought it or they got it for free from me. Who is accountable? The restaurant, restaurant owner, the recipe inventor, the cook, the guy from the supply chain, or the fisherman? You tell me. So the problem here from a legal perspective and a moral perspective is we as researchers must to make sure we must, we, we have to think that in the moment we produce an answer to somebody, this answer through the AI tool should be in itself accountable, at least from a moral perspective. If there is a law, then we'll pay twice. But I want to not pay at least once. I've done tens of years of research with colleagues from predictive toxicology. And I know how difficult their life is when they are expected to invent new things to make people's lives better. I'm talking about people in the pharma, in the cosmetics industries, in the food industry and so on. But one or a few people may still be affected and there is a moral uh, accountability to that as well. So when we're cooking our models, we should be prepared, in my opinion, to produce something similar with fuzzy logic or multi-valued logic approach to our model saying, if you want to be on the safe side, the model in itself is this and is still a weak model. If we want to be a strong model, then we need to come with degrees of our accountability on top of the model and to sell it as such, to name it, this dish contains fish. While actually you've done everything that the fish was fresh, things may still happen. If you know that you have at least a guest uh, kind of, um, I don't know, danger effect, of the fish into your safety or health, don't do it. So that's my point in which accountability should be shared between the users and the uh, producers. I'm not very sure if I, I, I answered, but this is a, a say a researcher perspective, not a producer perspective. I'm not a good businessman and never will be, but I'm so happy to participate in the say society safe journey towards making artificial intelligence nothing else but a partner into our industry 5.0 revolution and beyond. Hopefully we'll live to that time. So again, no full answer, but hopefully lots of thoughts. Uh, thank you for that. Have you got time for some more questions or? Yes, a few minutes. Okay, so um, I think a few of the questions have actually been answered in that anyway. Um, I'll answer it on the writing. We can pass now. So if you keep me the list, please. Yeah, I'll send you the list as well. Um, how can AI developers and researchers ensure that their data sets are diverse, representative, and unbiased, considering the potential impact of biased data in AI systems? Oh, that's a beautiful area in which John Marco will jump because bias is directly related to fairness. And uh, bias is an issue for human beings as well, isn't it? The human intelligence is still learning about bias. We, again, have to define the universe of discourse in which we should define all variables and to look at them from a statistical perspective and a social scientific perspective. So uh, the bias comes uh, in many aspects and in many features, and we shall actually name what is the outcome I just mentioned somewhere um, about the governance. Uh, so what is the outcome of our work? Okay, because we do not create artificial general intelligence, but that narrow intelligence in which we shall make um, uh, sure that actually the data is uh, well designed to service our purposes. So what I mean about this is the following. Imagine, this is the uh, picture we have, that we measure um, different symptoms from a human being going to the medical um, uh, center, to the health center. Okay, so you see the GP and GP will make use of the thermometer of the whatever, uh, will measure the weight, will measure the heartbeats, the uh, blood pressure and a few other things. And what we want to find out if somebody has or not cancer. We don't have, or it's extremely expensive to have direct uh, measurements of the cancer cells in somebody's body, right? So practically we may, we try to make use of a model that is using some signals that are or not 
fully, partly, or not correlated at all to the outcome. Okay, and now imagine, and the, the, one of the papers that has been presented just in the past weeks by our uh, interns from uh, student interns from Toulouse was about the um, diabetes data records in um, North America or in Canada, particularly um, related actually to the representation of Native Americans into the diabetes area. Okay, and you can imagine actually that, for example, taking just Bradford, the same will apply in there. People with diabetes in the Bradford area are represented in a particular way. If you move into, say, Yorkshire, statistically, people are represented differently. And then you move in England, again, statistics will play some games with us. So we'll need to define the outcomes of our models based on the data footprint and the expectations. It should be carried in a digital passport of the model. And then we'll say that the model can be biased and we'll acknowledge the bias because that model will be data driven. So if we want to be not data driven, then we should imagine a statistical experiment in which we'll collect the data that will be clearly related to the footprint of the population at hand. So what we miss in the machine learning era, in a deep learning era, in LLM era, is the fact that we do not live anymore into experimental data creation, but we make use of whatever it comes in our hands. It's exactly the same like cooking dishes on the way based on the ingredients we found in the market just because we return from job. So the dish comes on the day and therefore we take the responsibility and accountability of it and the bias is one of them. So be prepared for the bias and ask yourself what relevance has the bias in that data, okay? It's, it must be part of the equation, at the moment it's not. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that. Um, if you've got time for one more, there's an interesting question here and then I will send you the remaining questions Yes, uh, please. An email if that's okay. Okay, let's do it this way. Um, now, this one's quite interesting because it's who decides what is ethical? If we want unbiased AI, how can we dictate what is ethical as ethics are based on a group decision based upon their own learning cultures? Uh, yes, correct. And that's another point as well. You can imagine that actually ethics, but there is a lot of work, and I'm just going to the area here. So, ethics is the most studied and the most, say, viewed. Uh, topic of responsibility in artificial intelligence from almost anybody. So we have the United Nations, we have the uh, British government without the uh, European Union, we have the Canadian, the Chinese, the American uh, governments all already publishing or moving into legislation into the area of ethics. And interestingly, uh, for example, the British government has both uh, a portfolio of AI assurance, well, the AI uh, legislation will come, but at the same time, they are trying to make it pro-innovation. So the limitations to be flexible to allow uh, still innovation, which in other countries may be um, limited to some extent. So who's doing that? I would strongly encourage you to read the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence from the United Nations, from UNESCO. Okay, the document is available. Um, I'll just try actually to come now to our uh, Chris. I'll put it into. I'll I'll share actually the links with everybody. Okay. Thank you. So that will be uh, a way to uh, start understanding what legislative bodies including advisory boards like the UNESCO will do for some other governments having less uh, participation in uh, or practically impact into ethical AI into their own countries will do because that documentation is extremely interesting from the quite fresh at the same time and still ongoing okay um, uh, very interesting from the viewpoint of how ethics is assessed and take into consideration both from the data perspective, from the model perspective and the user's perspective. So yes, ethical AI is the most uh, research part and the most taken into consideration with evidences by legislatory and regulatory bodies. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, would you be able to share the presentation 
Daniel. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a PDF of them. Uh, most is based on public resources. So I'm very, uh, the organization of it is my own thoughts. So that's my own part of my own knowledge and intelligence. <laughs> so if it's something wrong, then I'll take the full accountability of it. Yes, uh, I'll share them uh, as a PDF and you can then uh, move it to the other. So there is no much uh, thing that is accountable in there, I hope, but I'm happy to receive feedback. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. I will um, get the remaining questions sent to you. Well, I'll send Please you. Please do. Apologies questions. for taking so long. Yes, uh, I'm sure actually, um, I stopped sharing. I'm sure that um, uh, there were other good questions and I'm sorry actually for taking so long. <laughs> But yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed a little bit of talk, at least from the perspective of how much I enjoyed putting it together. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and again, to all of the participants, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we will get the questions emailed out to all of the participants with the answers once Daniel's had a proper look at them. And also the slides, so you have all of the links. Um, and could you please also add the link to the talk, which quite a few people have um, shown an interest in as well. When I'm talking about the talk, uh, you are talking about the uh, reading club or? Yes. Yes, so uh, in, uh, at the moment I cannot make much use of my screen. So I'll share everything through yourself and then you'll um, put it into next to the talk or something similar. I can publish actually this, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm even not sure if at the moment I'm still sharing my screen. Uh, you're not, no, you're just on camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Because I cannot find the window uh, in which I'm talking, if you can imagine. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, so I can, uh, let me just put it in there. So the talk is tomorrow at, um, so on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Uh, British time. Okay. And uh, I, I think the best is to, to send it to you, Chris, because I need to manage a little bit of information here. Yeah, that's no problem. Mm, okay. So it's, I found it, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll just finish now. So I'll share it with you. It's easier because the time is late for even for myself. Well, thank you very much for your talk and I will stop the recording then. Thank you.